Welcome to CCV, everyone. We're so glad you joined us wherever you're tuning in from. I want to invite you to join in and worship with us. Come on. As I reflect, I find perspective. They're in the best and worst days of this life. You were always on my side. Yeah. You're in the pain. You're in the promise. And on the face, the furnace finds my faith. You're the fourth within the flame. I don't need to know what the future says. Cause if the past could talk, it would tell me this. My God is in fear. That's the truth today, come on. There's more ahead than what's behind me. Cause through the highs and lows and in between. God, you go ahead of me. Yeah. And where you call me, I will follow. And if the water falls beneath my feet, then you pull me. Slave to sin, Jesus died for me. 
I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Declare it today. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. truth today, that's the truth, as we sing these songs, as we think about what our God has done, who He is, I want to remind you today that our God is for you. He is for you and not against you. Our God is not keeping records of your wrongs or the things that you've done in the past that keep you from Him. He invites all of us into His family as dearly loved sons and daughters. Of God and so from that place we can know that because God is for us never once never once have we ever walked alone we're gonna sing one more song of worship to him and after that we're gonna have a time to reflect on and think about what Christ has done and take communion together because of the sacrifice of Jesus we know that the victory has already been won the victory is our God's no matter what challenges we face in this life no matter what battles we face, we do not face them alone. The battle belongs to our God, truly. And in His capable, strong hands, He will see us through. He'll see you through every single time. Every single time. Let's declare this together today. prosper and when the darkness falls it won't prevail cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph yes my God will never fail That's it. oh my God will never fail and I'm gonna see a victory victory for the battle belongs to you Lord and I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you Lord oh yeah all our days in your hands
God, they're in your hands. You take everything the enemy meant for evil, you turn it for our good. Declare it over your situation today. Come on. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You do, God. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. thank you today that we don't fight battles on our own and our own strength and our own wisdom but God we depend upon you we depend upon you because your word says you fight our battles for us you are our defender because of that we rejoice we rejoice today knowing that the truth the victory the hope all the hope this world needs is in your hands we thank you for this time to honor and worship you. We pray that as we reflect for a few minutes here, take communion together, God, that we continue in a posture of worship and remember all that you have done, the links that you've gone through to show your great love to us. We worship you for it. We receive your love and your grace. In Jesus' strong name, we pray, amen.
Well, I want to welcome everyone to CCV this weekend, uh, especially if you're joining us and you're new. It's, it's really an honor to have you with us. Um, I have a few staff in the room with me, which is a, a big help for me, and I'm thankful for them. But uh, no matter where you're joining from, uh, really think and hope that God speaks into your life today. I want to start by just asking you, when, when you grew up in school, what was your favorite subject in school? You know, some of you would say maybe math or science or art or English or history. And I can, I can read minds right now. I know what some of you are, are saying. Your favorite subject is what? PE. I love PE, you know? <laughs> so yeah, a lot of us did. When I was a freshman, actually, in the high school I went to, my very first class of the day, my freshman year, was a PE class. It was actually called basketball volleyball. You believe that? So literally all I did um, for uh, that first hour was I just got sweaty playing basketball and volleyball. And I, di- I didn't think about it until like years later, probably because I was just a 14-year-old, you know, pubescent teenager. But basically, no one in our high school ever took a shower after PE, and I didn't either. So, I mean, the first hour of the day, I just got sweaty like crazy, and then for the whole rest of the day, I sat in an enclosed room next to students, just stinky, all day long, you know? And I think about it now, and I think, you know, that could explain why I had no game with the ladies my freshman year in high school. I mean, I had nothing. It's because I stunk. Now, what does that have to do with the message? Absolutely nothing, actually. But it could explain for some of you why you struggled as well. Maybe you just smelled bad. You know, I don't know. But my favorite subject in high school, like bar none, and it still is to this day, is history. And the reason I love, uh, love studying history, even to this day, is because I really believe when you look at history, when you study the past, you can see the impact that our past has had on our present And when you study history, you can get an idea of how the past impacted the present and how if we repeat history, and history repeats, how the present can actually impact our future. And so what I want to do today, and I'm so excited about this, is I want to talk about what I think is maybe one of the most important and epic pieces of history in all of history. And the reason I want to talk about it is because I think it has profound implications on not only our today, but what could happen into our future. And the good news about this piece of history we're going to look at today, especially if you're not a follower of Jesus here today, and if you're not, we're so glad you're with us. Our church exists for people that are exploring and checking out and just want to see what Jesus is all about. But the piece of history we're going to look at today is not really a a piece of biblical history. It's just a piece of history history. In other words, um, it's just a part of secular history, and and almost all secular historians agree this is exactly what happened. In fact, what most believe is is the most important and significant uh, secular history book of all time was written by Edward Gibbon in the early 1700s. It's called The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire. It's a massive six-volume work. I have an abridged version in my office. It's still 1,300 pages. That's the abridged version. But Gibbon is not a follower of Jesus, but he documents what happens in the Roman Empire, and almost every single historian agrees that it is an unarguable fact that this is what happened. That in the year 33 AD, a man named Jesus of Nazareth is crucified by the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire, under the emperor Tiberius at the time, and a man named Pontius Pilate, who's a governor of a a region of the Roman Empire called Judea, that a man named Jesus is crucified. It's a historical fact. He's crucified. Now, what happens after he's crucified is that a small group of his followers are scattered. Persecution breaks out across the whole entire church as the movement begins to grow, and the Roman Empire tries to squash it out. For example, in the year 64 AD, the Emperor Nero, and you can look this up and fact check this yourself, the Emperor Nero begins a level of persecution that would be hard for us to fathom today. In fact, in Rome, he hangs Christians on stakes, lining the streets of Rome. Some of them, he puts animal skins on them with blood, and he allows wild animals to rip and tear their flesh from their bodies in front of everyone to see. A lot of the Christians he hangs on stakes, he lights them on fire to light the streets of Rome. Why? 
Because the Romans tried to do everything they could to squash out and destroy what became a growing movement, Christianity. And what becomes historical fact, this is just a fact, it's not a Bible fact, it's just a historical fact, is that less than 300 years after the crucifixion of Jesus, the Roman Emperor Constantine declares Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. I mean, think about this. How does a, 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 the, one of the greatest empires in world history, Rome, how do they go from crucifying Jesus, trying to squash out and persecute Christians, to all of a sudden, all of a sudden less than 300 years later, Christianity turns the world upside down and a majority of Rome becomes followers of Jesus. How does that happen? It's seemingly impossible. We've never seen anything like this in human history. How's it happen? I mean, if you had to guess how it happened, what, what, would, you, what would you think? I mean, how did it spread? How did it happen so fast? Because here, I mean, here would be really the basic question is this. How did the early church spread so fast and have such a massive impact on their world? What would be your guess? Maybe it was the awesome preaching you know, maybe they sent out missionaries and, and, and church planners like never before. You know, maybe they had rallies all the time. You know, maybe they took over the Colosseums across the Roman Empire and, and just like, you know, did rallies all the time. Maybe they did Christian concerts and they sold awesome, sweet Christian t-shirts that everyone wore and it transformed the empire. You know, maybe they put up signs everywhere all over the streets that maybe their form of, of social media at the time, maybe they leveraged their social media to transform everybody. Well, the answer is obviously, as you can imagine, is multifaceted how this happened, how this movement happened. And for sure, the boldness of Christians at the time had a lot to do with it. But I want to tell you today one reason, and I think a main reason, that Christianity spread at a rate that has never been seen, transformed an entire empire, and it's something that just doesn't ever get talked about these days. And the reason it's so relevant today is the reason Christianity spread has a lot to do with pandemics. What we're going through right now with COVID-19. Again, historical fact, go look it up for yourself. What happened in the Roman Empire for fact was this. Right after the crucifixion of Jesus and his resurrection, two massive pandemics hit the Roman Empire. The first was the Antonin Plague in 165 AD, and the second happens um, just a little bit of time later, called the Cyprian Plague in 249 AD. Now, these two pandemics were horrific. They make potentially what we're going through look like a common head cold. Most historians would say that the Antonin Plague was the first worldwide outbreak of smallpox with no vaccine and no way of fighting it. And they believe that the Cyprian plague, which ends up being a little bit worse, is actually potentially the first outbreak of measles or even Ebola. There's some debate there. Regardless of what they were, the health crisis of these pandemics, the disease that hits the Roman Empire, leaves a trail of death that would be hard for us to even fathom to this day. I mean, think about it. They, they, this, you know, whether it's measles or smallpox, which are completely deadly, completely contagious, there is no vaccine, there is no hospital system to fight it and like help like what we have today. I mean, it just spreads like crazy. I mean, for example, in the Cyprian plague, at one point, 5,000 people a day die in Rome over and over and over again. This plague actually wipes out one-fourth of the Roman Empire, 25%. I mean, our, our current projections for the COVID pandemic in the United States is that over 200,000 people will die. If we saw the same rates of death that they saw back then, we'd be talking about 80 to 100 million people just in the United States dying, and over a billion worldwide. That's how massive these pandemics were. And now you can understand why a historian like Kyle Harper said this. He said the plague, he's talking about the Cyprian plague, the, the plague nearly saw the end of the Roman Empire. That's what happened in history. Two pandemics massive hit the Roman Empire. And you're thinking, well, that's awesome, Ashley. Thanks for the pandemic history lesson. But how on earth did pandemics transform the world for Jesus Christ? Well, we have to understand what was going on at the time. And some of it's similar to today. In the Roman Empire, there was not one 
pagan religion. Not one that we can find that would have encouraged people to care about others and love others and be generous to others other than just focusing just on yourself. It's a very selfish culture. And you can see some of the selfishness in our culture now, but back then it was a radical selfishness. I'll just give you a couple examples. In, in ancient Rome, it was not uncommon and it was very acceptable that if you had a child as a family that you just didn't want the child or maybe you didn't think you could afford the child, that you would take the child out and dump them in the dump and just leave them for dead. And it was especially true of girls because if you had a girl as a baby, they were not as valuable in that culture as boys were and many girls were abandoned I almost thought about getting my, I'm a dad of three girls and I was heartbroken. I almost thought about like telling my girls like, look how lucky you are that your dad's a Christian and now, you know, I mean, I think that'd go over very well. But, you know, it's just, it's heartbreaking. This was the reality of Rome. And when it came to the sick, it was completely common, even if it was a family member, if someone got sick, you just let them die. You did not care. In fact, we know from history that when a plague hit, the physicians, even the, the phys- few physicians they had, they ran out of the city. And what happened? In the midst of this environment, Christians step up with a level of love and generosity that the world had never seen before. During these two pandemics, it was followers of Jesus that led the way to show the world generosity that they had never seen before. And so what you'll find, and this is documented, not even in scripture, it's documented by secular historians out there. What you'll find is this, is that what history shows is the generosity of Christians during pandemics causes people to take notice of Jesus. Why did Christians, why were they the ones that led with so much generosity and stepped in the gap in these massive pandemics? It's because who we follow, Jesus, gave a brand new ethic that no one had ever seen before. If you wanna open to the book of John chapter 13, we get some words of Jesus. And and we, we sometimes just gloss over these and we miss out on how unbelievably different they would have sounded to the culture at the time. And maybe for some of us even here in our world today. Jesus said this, In John chapter 13, 34 and 35. A new command I give you. Why is it a new command, Jesus? Because no one had ever said this before. I want you to love one another. Oh, not just be selfish and love myself. No, I want you to live an ethic where you care about others more than yourself. Yeah, but Jesus, how should I really love other people? He goes on to tell them. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Ooh, That's a radical kind of love, though, Jesus, because you gave your life. You laid down your life and gave up all your comfort, and you died for me. So you want me to lay down my rights and and give up even my well-being for the love of other people? Jesus says, that's exactly how I want you to love. And then he goes on to tell us what the result will be. By this, what's this? By your love of other people, your radical love and generosity, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Please understand when Jesus spoke this into this environment, as his Christians started living this out, it was the most radical thing the world had ever seen. And we know the early church did it. I mean, you just open up the pages of Acts and you begin to see it. It jumps off the page to you. I mean, Acts chapter four says this, and all the believers were in one heart and mind. No one claimed any of their possessions was their own. Wow. Wow. Nothing I have on this earth is mine. I don't claim it as my own. But they shared everything they had. This was so radical. And it goes on to tell us what the result was. Watch this. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. How did they have so much power? How did the world see Jesus so radically and the church spread so much? Because everyone was radically generous. The the verse right before it. No one claimed anything as their own. They shared with everyone. It was a radical love. And God's grace was so powerfully at work within them all as they radically led with generosity. And then it goes on to say this, and this is such a a phrase that should just stop you in your tracks. And there were no needy persons among them. In the early church, 
There were no needy persons among them. Why? Because those who had wealth and those who had dollars in that that society, they would sell things and they would bring it and put it at the apostles' feet. They'd bring it to the church and they distributed it to everyone that was in need. And this is how they lived their lives during the darkest pandemics this world had ever seen and it transformed the world for Jesus Christ. Now you, you read this and it's like, it sounds so utopian, right? Like no one considered anything themselves. They shared with everyone. There was no needy people. And yet it's exactly what they did. You know, when I think back to the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis, I really believe that what we saw at the beginning of COVID-19, the radical generosity of people, was the closest thing we have ever experienced in our lifetime to what we just read about in the early church. I mean, think about this just yourself. At the beginning of COVID, it was so radical. Everyone shared everything. This is not mine. You have a need. I want to meet the need. I mean, think about it this way. In your lifetime, have you ever seen people be so generous? Let me ask it this way. In your lifetime, have you ever been so willing to share your toilet paper with other people? I mean, it's unbelievable, right? My toilet paper is your toilet paper. You need groceries, done. You have a need, great. Financial, like hardship, let's step up and help them. I mean, could you imagine? It was spreading everywhere. People posting on social media everywhere. You have a need, I'm here to meet it. And I watched it even in my own life. I mean, we were so excited to be generous. Almost as if we were developing a new normal of generosity. And it felt good, didn't it? By the way, early in COVID, I would tell you as a pastor, we were seeing people explore and come to Jesus like never before. Exactly what Jesus said would happen when we show that radical kind of love. But here we are, four months later. It's been four short months, you know, plus months since the start of COVID. And I wonder, are we still seeing the most radical levels of generosity that we saw early on? Or are some of us a little tired? Are we getting a little weary? This is lasting longer than I thought. I mean, I'm cool doing like a couple weeks of like generosity and helping other people, but four plus months? I put it this way. I think at the beginning of COVID, everyone was willing to help anyone. You saw it. You saw it. Now here we are four four plus months later, and it's like it's harder to find anyone willing to help someone. I mean, it's just harder and harder to find the, the fire of generosity, And I'll just be, let me just be really, really transparent. I mean, I'll just be really transparent and I wanna be, wrestle with this as much as anybody. If I look at my own life, my own life, me, I do not see the same level of fire for generosity in my life that I had early in this crisis. I mean, I remember early in this crisis, man, our family was so fired up. I mean, we were going over to our neighbor's houses. We were meeting needs. We were picking up groceries for people. We were making care boxes and dropping them off all over the place. I know, I'll never forget at the beginning of this crisis, our family was together, and, and we met a single mom that, that really impacted us, and, and she, we knew she was in need, and she had young kids, and she was really struggling, and we all pitched in as a family and all of us, even the kids, I remember one of our kids had been saving so much money for a long time and she, she pitched in $50 and we all pitched in and, and gave this woman $250 as a tip at a restaurant to help her out. And I remember it, it was so awesome. And I just look now, and I'm just being, this is me, I'm just looking now and I'm saying, I don't think I have the same temperature of generosity that I had back then. Maybe we're just getting a little weary But what you need to know is in the early church, when their pandemics hit, they didn't get weary. And by the way, their pandemics lasted five times as long as any of ours. I mean, remember, they had no vaccines. They didn't know, they didn't have hospitals, treatments, drugs. This thing spread like wildfire. And yet they stepped up with a consistent, radical generosity day in and day out to change the world. Listen to what the bishop, 
Eusebius said, all day long, all day long, some of the Christians tended to the dying and to their burial, countless numbers with no one to care for them. Others, other Christians, gathered together from all parts of the city, a multitude of those withered from the famine and distributed bread to all of them. Radical generosity. While everyone else ran, they stepped up with a radical kind of generosity. And then he goes on to say this. This was the result. And the Christian's deeds were on the lips of of everyone's lips. Why? Because they never see anything like this. And they glorified the God of the Christians. What's that mean? People turn to Jesus in the midst of these pandemics when they saw the radical love of the church and Christians around them. In other words, if you're taking notes today, you have to understand we have to let this sink into our hearts. Our generosity is a key that opens hearts to the gospel. It's a fact. We can see it powerfully from history. We know looking at the two of the darkest pandemics in world history, that when Christians stepped up and led with a radical kind of generosity, it changed the world. It turned the world upside down. And that's why you can understand that a historian like Rodney Stark would say this. Some of the marked growth of the church in the early centuries can be attributed to the care and compassion Christians showed for the sick during pandemics. It's what happened. I mean, even later on, the emperor of Rome, Julian, not a Christian. This isn't even in the Bible. This is just in the, in the secular history books. He writes to some of his pagan priests in the Roman Empire pagan priests that are trying to promote these pagan religions, he writes to them, he's watching the spread of Christianity, it concerns him to death, and so listen to what he writes to his pagan priests. This is Julian, the emperor of Rome. When it came about that the poor were neglected and overlooked by the pagan priests, hey, all you pagan priests, you know all the pagan priests? They overlook everybody because they just care about themselves, because that's kind of what we've done, right? It says, when they were over- overlooked, the Christians devoted themselves to, to philanthropy. It is their benevolence to strangers, their care for the graves of the dead and their holiness. Are you guys seeing what they're doing? And then he goes on to say this. They support not only their poor, but ours as well. Guys, what is going on? I mean, I could understand the radical nature of them maybe supporting themselves, which is radical in and of itself, but they also support our poor, those who aren't Christians. All men see that our people lack aid from us. We're not doing anything. That's not how we we even operate. So you know what he goes on to say? This is the Roman emperor. He goes on to challenge the pagan priests to start acting like Christians. Step it up and start acting like Christians and start helping people because our pagan temples are emptying and Christian churches are filling up all across the Roman empire. This is what happened as Christianity spread. And what we don't sometimes talk about, and you don't hear this in ever, is that it happened, the early church spread because of two pandemics and how Christians led through them. That's how it happened. And it transformed the world. By the way, isn't that what you you want for our world? I mean, you look around you and you see the negativity, the hate. I mean, you get on social media and you just get... It's nauseating. I mean, don't you want to see our world transformed for Jesus? This is our time. It's a pandemic. And how we lead with generosity will determine the future of how God moves in our midst. And when Christians in the early church stepped up and led with generosity, you can understand why why Noah... Uh, Another historian, Candida Moss, a professor at Notre Dame, speaking about the Cyprian plague, the one we were just looking at, she said an epidemic that seemed like the end of the world actually promoted the spread of Christianity. But it was all how Christians led with love and generosity. And if it happened back then, it can happen again. If it happened back then, 
you better believe that it can happen again. And see, some of us doubt that in our hearts because we look around and we're like, it's so dark. But that's just because, remember what we talked about last week? That's because we're in the desert period right now. And when you're in a desert and it's really dark and all you can see is darkness all around you, it's hard to see any sort of light shining through. And yet, I wanna remind you today, especially if you're a follower of Jesus, I wanna remind you this, that faith sees best in the dark. When it's dark out there, it is our faith that should lead us to see that there is going to and can be good if we lead through this. So when it's dark out there, when it's dark out there, we turn to our faith and we lean into the call of Jesus to love radically and generously during this time. Maybe we should say it this way. Don't blame the dark for being dark. I mean, it's always going to be dark in this world. Instead, ask, is your light shining brightly in the dark? When it's darkest, the light should shine the brightest and the church should step up and lead like never before. So let me ask, is your light shining as brightly now as it did early in COVID? And I know the answer for me is I have to turn up the light. I have to turn up the temperature. I have to turn up my love. And I'm tired. I'm weary. This is lasting longer than a lot of us thought. But if we want to see the goodness on the other side of it, we have to step up today and lead with a radical kind of generosity that we can see the early church led with. So my question for you today is simply this. What's it gonna take? What's one specific thing you can do to develop a new normal with generosity during this pandemic? I mean, let's, let's let our generosity, this thing that was started, let's start a new normal. What's something during this pandemic that you can start as a new normal for your generosity? It could be a certain amount that you want to set aside and just really, really start doing something amazing to bless. It could be that you've never really started giving ever before. It could be people around you that you know are in need. It could just be that you, you know you need to start opening your eyes. And I want to challenge our church, our church, CCV, to start leading the way in our city when it comes to generosity. And you need to know as a church, we are always looking for ways to be generous. We're always. We want to be good stewards and lead with generosity. I'll just give you a, a few examples of some things we've been trying to do. Um, early in the COVID crisis, you know that there was a great shortage of N95 masks. And we had some great uh, leaders on our staff that we, they, they went forward and secured over 43,000 N95 masks, a cost of over $80,000 so we could step up and meet the need. And we've been distributing those masks. We've distributed them to first responders, to the medical community, to hospitals, to assisted living centers. We've distributed to the Navajo Nation as they hit really, really hard. And we're gonna continue to step up and do that because we wanna lead the way. We've recently um, helped a mission partner of ours that works with the homeless community and we've donated over $11,000 to help with the homeless community and needs that they, that they have. And you may have seen that was, that was picked up by the news. And again, just that's the, the love of Jesus being shared with our city. We're, we're packing 5,000 bags that are gonna be distributed to the school districts through a mission partner to help make sure that kids that are food insecure have the food that they need during this time. You remember early on in the pandemic, we heard about the, the, the blood shortage There's a shortage of blood and you heard it all over the news. You you don't hear that much anymore. You don't really hear about a blood shortage. I I wonder, I just wonder if that's because a few months ago, CCV, you stepped up all 10 campuses across seven days. Thousands of you gave blood across all of our campuses so that there's enough blood now to help over 2,200 people. You stepped up. It's your generosity. Through your generosity, And we don't talk about this a lot, but I'll just tell you, through your generosity, we're on pace this year, by the end of the year, to give away three quarters of a million dollars in benevolence to people all around our city. Benevolence, single moms who are in need. 
kids that need food and families that have fallen on hard times. We just wanna lead with generosity. And thank you for those of you that are generous that we can do so many of these things. And one small thing we're gonna do this week, and it's small, is I'm happy to tell you that starting Monday this week, across all 10 of our campuses, all of our campuses have coffee shops, Monday through Friday on our campuses, from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m., we're gonna open up all of our coffee shops to be available to anyone. You can come. We know a lot of places aren't available right now to meet or to come. And some of you have you know, online school starting. You might need a place for some free Wi-Fi and a place to, to meet with someone. And here's the best part about what we're gonna do. When you come, our coffee shops are open. There's fountain drinks. There's all sorts of coffee drinks. It will be 100% free. You're not gonna pay a dime. We just wanna be able to provide something for the community. You can invite a neighbor, you can invite a friend, say, hey, here's what you could do. You could say, hey, I wanna buy you a cup of coffee. And then you get here and you're like, oh, it's free. I really wanted to buy you something though. I really did. You know, I don't care what you do. But we just wanna do something that's small, we know. But we're gonna continue to try to lead with generosity. And that's just many things around here, but I see so many of you leading with generosity. You're not only giving and helping support your local church, but you're helping support many people around you. Um, I know early on, I heard the story of, of Jason and Jane who purchased enough food. They have a really large company and they purchased enough food for every single one of their employees to have food throughout this pandemic. It was awesome. I heard another couple stories. I heard this week from some of our CPs, Jeff and Kelly from our Scottsdale campus have been helping so many families. Thank you. I heard about John and Kathy from our Midtown campus. They've helped over a dozen single moms and many other families just with financial needs and other material needs that they can just step up and be generous during this time. I heard the story of a neighborhood group leader in Midtown who knew of a a grandmother who's a single grandmother, has custody of her grandkids staying at at her house. Imagine being a single grandmother, has custody of your grandkids, and she's just trying to make ends meet, and she had an over $1,000 home repair that came up, and this neighborhood group leader rallied people, and they took care of the whole thing. And I could go on and on and on. So many of you have given your stimulus checks. You're leading with generosity, and I just want you to know, your generosity is going to change the world. The question is, are you gonna keep it up? Have you turned up the temperature? Can we lead with generosity during this pandemic? Because I really, really believe it will determine whether or not we see Jesus lifted up during this pandemic. So let me ask again, what's something you can do? I mean, what's just one specific thing that you can do to develop a new normal where generosity is the mark of your life? It's our opportunity, CCV. It is. You know, I was, I was thinking about it this week and I thought, in history, I think many of us in our generation would have said that 9-11 was the, the pinpoint event in our, in our generation. And I just wonder if 30, 40, 50 years from now, if we're not gonna look back and see that it wasn't 9-11, but it was actually COVID. COVID may be the the mark of our generation. 9-11 was really significant, but it was a little bit of a flash event. People got really excited and people were really generous back then, but then it it, it subsided really quickly. This one's lasting longer and it may be longer affecting and, and we may see that if the church of Jesus Christ, if just us, if we step up in our city and we see our nation step up and in our world, we may see a move of people turning to Jesus like never before. Because during a pandemic, people are scared. They're fearful. The future is uncertain. People are open to Jesus. And when they see a church lead with generosity and love, it opens people's hearts and minds. And we have a chance to change our city during this time. So I wanna pray right now that God just put something on your heart, like he is my heart, of how we can lead with generosity. And I'm gonna pray our church continues to lead the way of showing a world that needs Jesus exactly who he is. Let's, uh, let's pray together. Father, thank you so much uh, that you have continued to give us a vision as a church to lead with generosity. And it may be no more important than during a pandemic. We can see from history, God, that, 
that pandemics can be times where the name of Jesus spreads like never before. And we don't wanna miss our opportunity. We don't wanna miss what may be a once in a lifetime opportunity, God, to lead with love and generosity to those around us so that we can let people know exactly who you are, God, that you're a God of generosity. You're a God that gave your only son so that whoever believes in you would not perish but have everlasting life. And would our generosity open people's hearts and minds and would we lead not in a self, selfish way but in a selfless way, the way you showed us to lead. We pray this all and now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, I'm praying that as you lead this week, you'll lead with some generosity. God will keep speaking into your life. Uh, we're really excited, by the way, as a church to continue on a path where we're planning on and looking at when we can meet physically again on all of our campuses. We believe that's really important. So stay tuned. Um, I'll be communicating on that in the, in the coming weeks. And until then, please keep going out and leading, leading, leading. We need leaders in this world like never before. Have a great week, CCV.